everybody. Dr. Ben here. Welcome. Sorry for the technical difficulties, but I'm glad you're joining us today. And I've got an assistant here manning the computer, so if you have questions, y'all can interact if you'd like to. Um, we'll blame that technical difficulty on the coronavirus. It's getting the blame for everything today. All right. So, Veritas Wellness, an introduction, introduction to the foundations of wellness. That's the class today. I'm super excited y'all are here. Um, I just want to briefly say, I'm sorry we can't meet in person. Some of you are out of town and out of state, so I understand that. But the situation we're in with coronavirus, of course, I've got to speak to that just a little bit. And it's actually pretty amazing timing. Um, the things that make us susceptible to coronavirus are the same things that make us susceptible to heart attacks and cancer and all the chronic diseases that Americans struggle with. So the things you're going to learn in class in the coming weeks um, will help you not only to defend yourself against corona, but against everything else too. I started to learn this about seven or eight years ago when I had a doctor tell me there's no such thing as diseases, they're all consequences. And that statement kind of shook me um, because obviously as a conventionally trained medical doctor, I could not believe that. I felt like if there was a root cause to disease, we would have learned that in medical school and we would have addressed it. But that's not the case, as we'll get into here in a minute. We good? Probably. It's not unlisted. Do you want to okay. okay. Yeah, let's just keep going. Just keep going. Okay. Sorry, another technical difficulty. All right, so let's dive in here. I want to start with this to try to get your attention. And I do want to say before we start, um, this class, I know there's participants in here coming from all walks of life, all different levels of understanding about health and wellness. Some totally coming from a conventional mindset, don't have a clue about diet and lifestyle things. And that was me seven or eight years ago, and that's most conventional doctors, unfortunately, because we don't get trained in diet and lifestyle in medical school. And I know some, some others of you um, have been down this road for a while. So the purpose of this class, especially the introduction, is kind of bring everyone to a, a level playing field. Um, so I'm going to speak to some um, basic things here, but as we get through the class, we'll, we'll get into more mature things. But I also do want to say this is an introductory class. There is no way to get into the deep dive of everything. But part of the beauty of God's design of our body, you don't have to necessarily take the deep dive into nutrition and spend a whole year at school learning about these things or hydration or movement or peace. The whole four pillars is kind of a simplified approach, but I think what you'll see by the end of the six weeks is it covers a lot of bases, and I think it covers all the bases. So it's great to know some science behind it, but we're not gonna go super deep into all that because it's just too much, it take too much time. So I hope to give you enough, not overwhelm you, but give you enough to have confidence in and to wanna to pursue this more. And again, I'm here to teach you the why but then it's the wellness navigators, Angie and Nicole and Kim, and there'll be others in the future who will teach you the how. And that's the most important part of the whole thing, and that's where all the value's at, I believe. I know people think the value's with me and the knowledge and the teaching, but it's really not. That's just to renew your mind, but then you need to walk with somebody to change the, the lifestyle and the diet. So that's what the wellness navigators are for. So this first slide here, healthy lifestyle may prevent 80% of heart attacks. Heart attacks are the number one killer in America. And this article is saying 80% are pre preventable, not by lowering cholesterol and blood pressure and all the things that pharmaceuticals do, but by addressing diet and lifestyle. Here's your number two killer, cancer. This is from a journal in uh, 2008, the pharmacy research, pharmaceutical research journal. Only 5%, 5 to 10% of all cancers, your number two killer, are related to genetics. The rest are diet and lifestyle. And it's not just this article, there are many articles that support the same thing. So I just told you the top two killers in America, killing hundreds of thousands of people every year, are diet and lifestyle related. And doctors get about two hours, at least I did, of nutrition and four years of medical school. And really nothing on exercise of value or hydration or peace. <clears throat> so it's no wonder our health outcomes are so bad. I put this slide in here. I know I will reference this, um, Dr. Weston A. Price. He was a dentist in Cleveland in the 1920s, and he started to see a little uptick in chronic disease in his patients. 
And so he and his wife decided to leave America and go find people in the world who were still healthy, who were not getting cavities and cancer and heart disease and high blood pressure. So they did, and they spent 20 years sailing around the world, and they would stop and live with a people group for one to two years, document how they lived and how they ate. They would take samples of their food, send it back to his lab in Cleveland, and analyze the nutritional content of these native foods. And then they'd go on to the next people group and the next and the next. So they went from Canada to Alaska to the Orient to the South Pacific to the Amazon rainforest, and then across the Atlantic to Switzerland and, and throughout Europe and Africa and 14 different groups, and it was fascinating. But the one thing I'm going to point out here in his book, he talks about immunity to cavities, immunity to malignancies, but also immunity to tuberculosis. And so I'm throwing this in for the whole coronavirus piece of it. What he found was certain villages were over, being overcome with tuberculosis and dying from this infection. Another village just 10 miles down the road, there was no tuberculosis. And the difference that he saw was that the one village was eating processed, enriched flour and sugar. The other village was still eating their native diet. And that was really it. And he documented this throughout the world. Fascinating stuff. So be confident that even though it's just basic diet and lifestyle stuff, the basics allow your body to function like it's supposed to and keep heart disease, cancer, tuberculosis, and other infections like corona at bay. You're going to be exposed to things. The body knows what to do with that, and you don't have to worry about it. You can be at peace. So another stat I want to throw out there is pre-World War II, which is really pre-Weston A. Price, America was the number one healthiest country in the world. Health outcomes-wise, we rocked it. We, we dominated. And now, 70, 80 years later, we're dead last. Of all the industrialized countries, our infant mortality is the highest, our overall mortality is the highest, number of chronic diseases. I mean, you look at any category, and we come in dead last. And the point of that is it's not your genes. Okay, little intro for me. Um, there's my family, my wife, Jamie, our six kids. I try to tell people I'm just a normal guy, a normal doctor, and then they see six kids and think I'm crazy. I'm not normal. Who has six kids? but we're blessed to have them. And I couldn't be who I am without Jamie and the kids. Here's my diplomas. Went to Baylor undergrad, went to UT Houston Medical School, went to Waco Family Practice for residency, and I was chief resident there, graduated in 2002. Left there looking for a small town to practice in. I wanted to follow my grandfather's footsteps. Both my granddads were small town country doctors. They did it all. They could fix broken bones, deliver babies, do house calls, you name it. They, they took care of the whole family. Um, so I wanted to do what they did. We headed west, looked at 30 different small towns throughout West Texas, and settled on Post, Post, Texas, Garza County, uh, named after C.W. Post, who was the founder of that town, who is the serial magnet, Post Toasties and all that. He also invented lots of other things, a really interesting town, and it was a great place to spend the next seven years. These are my granddads um, at my um, medical school graduation day, UT Houston. There's Garza County Health Clinic. When we arrived at Garza County, they were using an old rundown hospital for a clinic. It was very inefficient. They were losing $10,000 a month, the health the healthcare district was. They had a nurse practitioner there a couple, of three days a week, um, and it was just not a well-functioning clinic, and they were losing lots of money. And we, my wife and I prayed on it and decided that's where God wanted us to be. So we went and had a great team, had a great nurse, had a great office manager. The community got behind us and we were successful there. So they built this new clinic for us, a million dollar clinic, state of the art x-ray, um, lab, you name it. It was awesome, beautiful building. One year after that clinic was built, the million dollar banknote was paid off. A year after that, a million dollars is sitting in the bank account of the healthcare district. They were collecting tax from the citizens but not needing it because the clinic was self-sufficient because of volume. I was seeing a patient every seven minutes on average. I'd see 40 or 50 patients a day, and I knew how to work that system. Um, you survive in a small town clinic like this, or really in any clinic, um, by, by volume and procedure. So if you do things with your hands, you get paid more. The reimbursement committees that, that determine what rate a doctor is going to be reimbursed are heavily influenced by doctors that work with their hands, i.e. surgeons. So you get paid more by working with your hands. So I learned while I was talking to you about your diabetes, I'd also pick some earwax out of you or cut a, cut a mole off or a skin cancer, skin tag or an ingrown toenail or something I could do with my hands because that'd, that'd pay more actually. <laughs> Picking earwax paid more than talking to you about your diabetes. So I'd do both. 
So I learned how to maximize every office visit, and I learned how to be very efficient, and that's why we were successful, quote unquote successful. Financially, we were successful. The door stayed open, the debt was paid off, the million dollars sat in the bank, everybody's happy. I'm happy, the county's happy, the taxpayers are happy, everybody's happy. Texas Monthly came and did this article on us. The Washington Post picked it up and decided to come to Post Texas and follow me around for a week and put us on the front page. So now there's fame, fortune, and, it, and I'm living my dream, living the, you know, raising the kids in a small town, doing everything a small town doctor does. So things are great. And I'm not trying to be boastful here. What I'm doing is setting the stage for what comes next. And what comes next is a divine intervention where I met this doctor who told me there's no such thing as diseases. They're all consequences and that the way I was trained in medical school was just to treat a symptom, not get to the root cause. I mean, he hit me with all this stuff and it kind of rocked my world. And eventually, after a year of wrestling with this and talking to him over and over, not believing him, um, I sent him my 10 sickest patients and they all came back well. Most of them all the way well. And we're talking the worst of the worst, fibromyalgia, ulcerative colitis, brittle diabetic, lupus, you name it. Um, the ones that had seen all the specialists in Lubbock, had gone to Dallas to the super specialist at Southwestern and were still not better, had tried everything. And I was at my wit's end. And they went and saw this integrative physician They came back better. That opened my eyes. That was about seven to eight years ago and about 2012, 2013. So from that point on, I decided I had to learn this and that led me to um, establishing Veritas Medical had to leave the county clinic because you can't do what we do in seven minute visits. We take one to two hours with our patients. It takes that long to teach a patient about diet and lifestyle changes to get to the root of it. But through these seven years of doing that with Veritas Medical and treating over 18,000 patients, me and, and the nurse practitioners um, that are in my office, what became very clear is you can treat patient symptoms with pharmaceuticals as we were trained in medical school, or you could treat the patient with nutraceuticals, supplements, and different modalities in the natural healing realm. But really, if a patient couldn't get their stress under control and get the diet right and move a little bit every day and, and hydrate well, they really didn't get all the way well, even with all the green version, all the different herbs and different cool supplemental things. So that's where the four pillars emerged early on. I could see that people really needed that foundation and that foundation doesn't require a doctor. Nutrition, hydration, movement, and peace does not require a doctor. It requires a teacher and the Latin root of physician is teacher. So actually I think all physicians should be teaching this. And for those who elect to not pursue those four pillars, then fine, at least they're informed and they know and they're making an informed choice to just treat a symptom. Unfortunately, somewhere along the way, someone decided for us Americans that we just weren't going to address diet and lifestyle. We were too lazy or too busy or too whatever. And so they just took that option off the table. And therefore, the only two options are suffer or treat a symptom. That's the only two options doctors know, doctors know about and most of the general public knows about. That third option is just not even discussed or talked about really. So fast forward 70 years of doing that, practicing medicine that way and taking care of people that way, and here's the results we get. Americans are retiring later, dying sooner, and sicker in between. U.S. life expectancy declining yet again. Here's another one. United States comes in dead last again compared to other countries. Another one. A distinctly American phenomenon. Our workforce is dying faster than any other wealthy country this study shows. This is from November of 19. But you can go back over many years and you'll see these same headlines year after year after year. There's not a good solution that's been proposed by any institutional organization, government organization that I've seen. And when you practice as, as we do, just treating a symptom, and you do this for two or three or four generations, here's what you'll start to see. This is the Blue Cross Blue Shield Millennial Health Study 2019. And what they show here is that decline in health, major decline in health, starts at age 27. This is for the millennial group, age 27. Here's what our curve should look like. We should just live our life until the day that our spirit's called home and our flesh falls over dead. Our health curve 
should match our lifespan curve, or at least be real close to it. This, 27 years old, starting to decline, is awful. And that's the point of this class. I'm here to try to get this message to you, and then you can get it to your family, your friends, and your communities, because this is a travesty, and it doesn't need to happen. Um, so let's let the truth be known and then let people decide and choose. Here's a little more detail of that millennial health study and I want to highlight this over here on the side. Millennials double digit increases eight of the top ten conditions and this is from 2014 to 2017 they looked at these top ten conditions and saw these double digit increases. <clears throat> Here's um, an article about kids dying younger. Our kids in America die younger than any other country. According to the CDC, this was a few years ago, they released this stat, the kids born after the year 2000 will not outlive their parents' lifespan, first time since the American Revolution. Another headline, we are the most obese nation in the world and that's growing year by year by year. It used to be 30% of the population, then 35, 40, now I think we're at 50% of the population is obese and that's not counting the overweight. And just looking around, I mean, you see it, go to the store, go to the mall, go to the park, you'll see this obesity epidemic. Here's some cancer stats. This is from 2015-2016. This is from Dr. Nasha Winters, a colleague of mine that I highly admire. She survived stage 4 ovarian cancer using some natural remedies. But one out of two men will have cancer. One out of 2.4 women will have cancer. These are in people born after 1960. No real change in survival rates since 1950 when we um, <clears throat> really started tracking these stats aggressively. And cancer soon will overtake cardiovascular disease as the number one killer, probably. That's what the statisticians tell us. And rates are expected to double by 2030. So pretty much we're going to be living in a world where it's not the question of do you have cancer or not. It's going to be, well, what kind of cancer do you have? What kind of cancer do you have? Everyone's going to have this cancer based off the trajectory of these curves. Here's 1960s versus 2000s, and this is autoimmune disease. So autoimmune disease is when your own immune system turns on itself and starts attacking your own self. So that's multiple sclerosis, Crohn's, type 1 diabetes, asthma. I read the other day 25% of girls in America age 25 and under thyroid autoantibodies. They're making antibodies to their own thyroid gland, and we see that all the time in our clinic. This is a real busy slide. The main point I want to make out, the past 30 years, increase of 2 to 50 times um, in dozens of different disorders. <clears throat> this is a real busy slide, and if your screen's not big, you can't see it, so I'm just going to tell you that's the United States there, and I'm going to circle um, who wins or who loses in each of these columns. Life expectancy, infant mortality, percent of population of um, over age 65 that has two or more chronic conditions, obesity rates, we're dead of all the countries, we come in last. So that was a whole lot of stats on how sick we are. Um, it's true, we are sick, we're very sick. We didn't used to be this way. It wasn't very long ago we were the healthiest. <clears throat> you would think, well, maybe we're just not going to the doctor much. Maybe we're not taking enough meds. Maybe we're not spending enough money. And I think we all understand that none of that's true. Here's an article about the U.S. healthcare spending twice as much as other countries and getting the worst outcomes. Here's another one the United States and healthcare dollars far outpacing all the other countries. Here's one about your premiums and deductibles going up um, faster than your cost of living and your overall inflation. So here's your earnings and inflation down here, and the blue is your premium, the yellow is your deductible, and I think we're all feeling that the last few years, these costs just going up. And the reason being, this system cannot work, will not work, it doesn't matter if you're Democrat, Republican, whatever, no healthcare system is going to work when it's based off treating symptoms because what happens is it'll work as long as you have enough people in the population paying into the system that don't need it, meaning they're healthy. You have enough healthy people paying in, only a few sick people needing services and pulling out, then that system can work. But we've reached a tipping point now. We don't have enough healthy people paying in. We have more people needing services than are healthy paying in not needing services. So it's tipped. There's no way to, to fix that besides put more of the cost onto the patient and cut services, and we're seeing both of those. Or the other solution, which isn't going to happen in this system, unfortunately, because there's no money in it, is fix the problem. 
And that's what we'll talk about more throughout this. And your employers are, are feeling it too. If you're a small business owner, you know what I'm talking about. These are employer contributions in the blue, and they've skyrocketed. And one more slide. Here's the U.S., and this is um, spending. So we, we spend the most, and this is performance, and we're not very high on the performance. So we're the least performing, highest spending. <clears throat> and here's why. I use this analogy because I think it really drives the message home well. And I'm telling you, this is exactly analogous to your, your human body. So my wife had a slow leak in her tire one, one day on her Tahoe. And I chose the quick, convenient, cheap, only cost me a quarter <laughs> copay, to just fill up that tire with some air. Because it was a slow leak, that was fine for four or five days. But by the fifth day, it was flat enough, she needed more air. So I ran over to the filling station again, put a quarter in, filled it up with air again, and she was fine. She could, for the moment, get her stuff done. It temporarily fixed the problem, treated the symptom. The low air pressure is a symptom. The root cause is a hole in the tire. I know that sounds simple, but I'm telling you, like type 2 diabetes, high blood sugar, that's the symptom. Insulin resistance, that's the root cause. So the high blood sugar is just the air in the tire that's getting low, the air pressure. The hole in the tire is insulin resistance. Doctors are only trained in how to fill the air in the tire, how to drive blood sugar levels down with drugs and insulin shots. But over time, it doesn't work. So as I filled this tire up week after week after week, because I was too busy and it was too convenient, too cheap, um, what I did not think about and what we don't think about as Americans, doctors or patients, is unintended consequences. So I got the quick fix on her tire, and she was able to get to the store and take the kids where they needed to go, but I didn't think about, and this is probably decreasing the life expectancy of this tire, deflating, inflating, deflating, inflating. It's probably hurting the shocks and the struts and the alignment. It's probably putting more strain on the other three tires. It's probably increasing her risk of a blowout and rollover and, and death and injury and all these things that I didn't think about it increased the risk of. And that's, that's it in a nutshell. So in med medical school, I thought there were these two options. Option one, a patient can do nothing about their diabetes, high blood pressure, reflux, whatever, just suffer. Or option two, treat the symptom. That's it. Option one, option two, I didn't know about option three, fix it. I didn't know you could fix the, the hole in the tire. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, if you're going to only fill up the tire a little bit. If you're not going to address the root cause, which is diet and lifestyle and cancer, then you should expect these kind of outcomes. And what I'm talking about here is, this is real small writing, I, I know, so I'm just going to read it to you. This is a study they did <clears throat> just a, a few years ago, and they looked at the overall contribution of curative and adjuvant cytotoxic chemotherapy to five-year survival in adults, and they estimated this to be, this is the contribution of chemotherapy to five-year survival. 2.3% in Australia, 2.1% in the United States. We should expect this. We should expect the symptom treatment, chemo, to get really poor outcomes of 2.1%. If the root cause of cancer is 95% of the time, not your genes, it's diet and lifestyle. And that's what we see. If we're just going to treat a symptom, we're going to get poor outcomes, and we're going to continue to get poor outcomes. Now, we did see this um, just a few weeks back. Could have been a couple months now. This article came out. Cancer death rates post biggest one-year drop ever. As you dive down into this study, they found two things that drove this. One, a significant decline in smoking. That's a lifestyle thing. I, I say the S is in lifestyle. You need to think about sugar, smoking, sitting, stress, sleep deprivation, all these S's. That all falls under lifestyle. So smoking, a lifestyle factor, cause a decrease in cancer. And the second thing that they attributed this decrease um, in cancer death, immunotherapy. Now it is a pharmaceutical, but it's a pharmaceutical, it's not chemotherapy. It, these are drugs that are designed to stimulate your own immune system to wake up, identify the cancer cell, and kill it. Cancer cells have an ability to camouflage themselves from your immune system because your immune system is designed to detect and kill a cancer cell and it just can't see it. So these therapies help to do that, help your own immune system do what it's supposed to do. Fascinating. That's how we see a drop in cancer rates. 
<clears throat> there's that healthy um, lifestyle can prevent heart attacks. So if doctors aren't going to be trained and taught and teach their patients how to deal with diet and lifestyle, you should expect articles like this to come out. Stents don't prevent heart attack or death. Here's another one. Unbelievable. Heart stents fail to ease chest pain. Now, show that I know those can be some, some shocking um, headlines, but let me tell you, the root cause of heart attacks is not eating fat. It's not eating bacon. You know, this thought that you eat some bacon grease and it's going to go clog your coronary artery just like it clogs the drain. If, if you put bacon grease down your, your drain in your kitchen sink, you know, it builds up on there. That's not how it works. It's not how the body works. The body breaks that fat down. When you swallow it, your digestive enzymes break it all down, and you act, the body prefers to use fat for fuel. It's a great energy source, actually. <clears throat> and I'm not going to go off on the cardiac coronary artery disease thing. I'm just pointing out. You're going to continue to get bad outcomes if you're not getting to the root cause, and the root cause is not blockages in the coronary. That's an end game result. That's one of the consequences at the very end of the road after you have not stewarded your diet and lifestyle. The body's actually laying down that plaque and that blockage as a response to something in the body. We'll, we might get into that in a different um, lecture another day. <clears throat> One more, diabetes. American Heart Association says diabetes is not a choice and also says diabetes is a chronic progressive disease. However, Dr. Jason Fung, who I love and I highly recommend his books, I've interviewed him on my podcast, go look that up, he's awesome. He's a nephrologist in Toronto and a nephrologist is a kidney doctor. A kidney doctor is not even going to see a diabetic patient until they're at the end of the road. They're ready for dialysis. And even in those very sick diabetic patients, been diabetic for 20 or 30 years and their kidneys are, are shot, he sees reversal by addressing the diet and the lifestyle and implementing a lot of fasting. So two totally different opinions here. American Diabetes Association says it's a chronic progressive disease. Dr. Fung says, no, it's totally reversible, but it's a dietary disease. It cannot be cured by lowering blood pressure. You've got to address the insulin, as I mentioned earlier. One more analogy to drive this point home, because diabetes is so prevalent in our world, I like to really drive this home. And this is <clears throat> out here in West Texas. We have a lot of farmers, so I give this analogy of a farmer's out in the field plowing, and his tractor breaks down, and he gets off to fix something, and he slips, and he cuts his leg on that tractor. He's got a big gaping wound and he just kind of ignores it and doesn't do anything with it and in a few days it's it's infected and it's weeping pus and it's getting red a few days later he's got a fever 102 fever and so he goes to the medicine cabinet and gets some Tylenol some ibuprofen and he's alternating every two hours and he got that 102 temperature down to 98.6 with that Tylenol <clears throat> and so and then he thinks okay I'm cured I'm good to go no problem now, I know this sounds silly and everyone knows that there's no way he's going to survive, but that's all he's going to do. You've got to fix the infection. When you fix the infection, temperature comes down all by itself, and it's the same with type 2 diabetes. You fix the insulin resistance, the blood sugar comes down all by itself. And if you just chase blood sugar with Tylenol Motrin or medications, metformin, the diabetes pills, you just bring those numbers down, blood sugar numbers, it does not translate to long-term outcomes that are beneficial, and that's what this study shows. This is a doctor at Mayo Clinic, and I know it's small writing again, so I'll just read it to you. <clears throat> His question was, does controlling your sugars reduce the risk of complications? This is Dr. Victor Montori at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota, and this study says no, it doesn't. If you just keep blood sugar levels down with medications, you still get the long-term complications of diabetes. Obviously, you're still going to die from gangrene if all you're doing is lowering your temperature with Tylenol. So this brings us to epigenetics, above the genes. And this is a term you need to become familiar with. We'll talk about it a lot. And really, this is kind of a scientific term for everything that it's, it's not everything outside the genes, which really falls into diet and lifestyle. It's things in your diet and lifestyle and even your thoughts that impact the genes and turn genes on and off. And we'll talk about more in the peace pillar um, in a few weeks, how a negative thought can actually tighten that DNA, that double helix that we're all familiar with. It'll tighten that up, a thought that's not based in the truth. So let's get into some examples of this epigenetics. This agouti gene, it's really interesting. These mice, they're fat and they're yellow. That's an agouti mouse there. So we've bred these mice so that we can study obesity and diabetes and stuff like that. And they have this gene called the agouti gene that makes them obese. So in this study, what they did is they fed the, mo the mom, mother mouse, a goody mouse, B vitamins prior to conception, 
and they did, and these moths delivered babies that were normal, brown fur and not fat. Just a B vitamin supplement in the diet of mom prior to conception. So what I'm saying is the B vitamin, it kept that gene suppressed or turned off, so it did not express itself. So genes are like books on a bookshelf. You can go into a library and see a million books on the bookshelf, but you don't know what they say until you go pick one up, open it up, and start reading it. That's called genetic expression. And the thing that tells the librarian which shelf to go to and which book to pick and what page to turn to and which paragraph to read, that instruction, that influence on your librarian comes from your thoughts, your diet, your movement, or lack thereof, <clears throat> all the diet and lifestyle stuff we're going to talk about. Dean Ornish proved this a few years ago at UCLA. He did a study of the prostate cancer. In this study, what he did was take biopsies of these prostate cancer patients, and he looked at the genes, and the cancer grow gene was turned on, and the cancer suppressor gene was turned off. Then he put them through some number of weeks or months of diet and stress management. The cancer suppressor gene flipped on, cancer grow gene turned off, PSAs went to normal. Fascinating study. Here's the Pima Indians, pre-World War II, zero cases of type 2 diabetes. Now 50% of the tribe has diabetes. It is not genetics because that Pima Indian, it's the same genetic group. It's a diet thing that changed. Same thing with the Aborigines in Australia. Exact same thing. The magic pill demonstrates this. This is a documentary on Netflix. And part of this documentary, they talk about these Aborigines are just dying from obesity and cardiovascular disease and diabetes and hypertension, all these Western diseases. And they didn't used to die from that, even just one or two generations ago. And the government was pouring millions of dollars into these diabetes prevention programs and stuff, and it, it wasn't working. So this young couple comes in and puts these aborigines into a boot camp basically for a few weeks or two weeks, I think. And all they did was teach them how to eat, prepare food and eat like their grandparents and their parents did. And they did that, and the diabetes went away. <clears throat> Here's another one, the longevity plan, Dr. Day. Dr. Day's a cardiologist up in Utah. Um, he happens to speak Chinese, and he was in China giving a lecture. Dr. Day was only like 48 years old, but he was on seven or eight different medications, multiple diseases, and he was just sick. And his colleagues in China noticed this, and they started talking to him about longevity and diet and lifestyle and these things. And they took him to the Longevity Village, which is one of the blue zones in the world. So if you haven't heard of blue zones, there's people groups around the world that have a high percentage of centurions in their population. And the Longevity Village in China is one of the bluest of the blue zones. So Dr. Day went there and studied what they ate and how they lived and all that. But then he took it a step further. And by the way, I mentioned here, he talked to this 112-year-old guy out in the rice field working and the guy said, yeah, I feel like I'm in my prime, mentally and physically fit at 112. <clears throat> so what Dr. Day did, he took it a step further and he drew their blood and he looked at the genes that make people uh, susceptible to Alzheimer's and cancer and stroke and heart attack and they had those genes, but they didn't have the disease. That goes back to Weston A. Price and the 20 different, the 20 years and 14 different people groups and he saw the same thing. Malignancies were coming in and tuberculosis and cavities just when people changed their diet and started eating what's called modern food. Um, fascinating research. That book, Nutrition and Physical Degeneration, it's a thick read. It's full of lots of data and research and photographs, and it's not for the faint of heart for sure, but it's considered the Bible of nutrition. And we pull a lot of our stuff from there because what he noted was Obviously, the Eskimos weren't eating the same thing as the South Pacific Islanders, and they weren't eating the same thing as the Africans. They were all eating different diets. And I'll just go ahead and get a little bit into the nutrition lecture. Um, I'm going to tell you <clears throat> this um, division that we're seeing in the world of vegan versus not versus an plant and animal based and all these things is division, division, division. I have all the above cookbooks in my, in my house. I have a vegetarian cookbook, paleo cookbook, keto cookbook, um, Weston A. Price's cookbook, Betty Crocker cookbook. I've got them all. It's not about um, like a narrow focus on just one type of diet, so to speak. It's some basic foundational knowledge about what's good nutrition and what's not. What, and I classify it as God food versus man food. And there's different seasons in our life, and that's what Weston Price saw in his work. Sometimes people were eating mostly plants. Sometimes they ate nothing but animal products and sometimes um, a blend. And, you know, it varied. So <clears throat> we'll talk about that more in the nutrition lecture. It's usually not just a one-size-fits-all, and it's usually not a certain diet just for your whole life. 
Some more on epigenetics. This is measles mortality rates. I like to bring this in because of the measles scare recently. Now it's all coronavirus. But as you can see, I hope you can see here, 1900 um, up to 1964 and then on to 1984. So this is the mortality rates. And you can see a lot of death from measles, but a huge decline. And that's about a 99% decline in measles mortality in the United States prior to the vaccine. Here's your measles vaccine, 1963. So that's not what made measles go away. But we, it's clear, very clear in the literature, sanitation and nutrition. When we got the terrain right, the bugs went away, just like the cockroaches in your kitchen. You could stomp them every morning when you wake up to kill them, or you just get your garbage out of the kitchen. Cockroaches go away all by themselves. Here's some more epigenetics. I point out on this slide what this research showed was your chances of cancer type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular disease, so there's all your top killers, back pain, <clears throat> with one simple lifestyle change, reduce the time you spend sitting. That's one of those S's I mentioned. That's one thing only. They could still be eating the standard American diet, and just by getting up routinely, you cut your risk of all those things, and you can throw a coronavirus in there too. In fact, um, he says sitting is more dangerous than smoking and kills more people than HIV. So even more than these bad infections, just sitting. This is knowledge we need. And going to the gym at the end of the day and working out for 45 minutes does not make up for eight hours of sitting all day long. <clears throat> Here's another um, epigenetic um, phenomenon. Just being outside, being in a green space, it talks about residential green space in childhood is associated with lower risk of psychiatric disorders from adolescence into adulthood. Here's another one. Green spaces in cities can help people live longer. This book has 400 different studies about how green spaces are beneficial for health. Here's another book on the circadian code, Dr. Panda. And what he shows, it's probably hard to see on this slide, but these are ancestral rhythms versus modern rhythms. And what he's talking about is circadian rhythms and the amount of time we're exposed to light like from electricity, these light bulbs, screens, our phones and all this stuff, TVs and iPads. Um, you know, used to, and if you go out camping, you know, when the sun goes down, you're out. There, you don't have light, you have to just go to bed. And when the sun comes up, you get up. So there's a natural rhythm to life. Um, but what we do now, we have this um, more, uh, a wider opportunity to do stuff like stress out and eat. <laughs> And what he has shown on this next slide shows it. He showed this in rats. He fed these rats the same chow, the same rat chow. So not any more calories, not any different food, same amount, same kind. All he did was random eating. So these rats could eat any time they wanted, all day and night, where these rats down here were restricted to an 8 to 12 hour window. Just restricting the more narrow eating window decreased the chance of all these chronic diseases, obesity, diabetes, fatty liver, heart disease, inflammation, everything just from narrowing the eating window so I just told you quit sitting so much and narrow your eating window two simple steps and you're going to dramatically impact your chances of these chronic diseases that are overwhelming Americans and here's here's another um, same thing circadian rhythm and a third of all genes are affected by circadian rhythm this study down here good sleep can offset genetic susceptibility so even if your granddad and your your dad had these strokes, you can turn that gene off according to this study, and this is just with good sleep. Microbiome, we're not going to take a deep dive into this because we don't have time, so I'm going to go through it really fast, but I'll just tell you there's more bacteria, virus, and parasite in you and on you than there are of your cells. Ten times more. Your 90% of your DNA that's found in a human body is not human DNA, it's the bacteria, virus, parasites. Um, I've seen estimates, you know, 37 trillion bacteria, 370 trillion viruses in the human body at any one time. It's amazing. I graduated from medical school in 2002. There were only two articles with the word microbiome. So if your doctor's my age or, or older, he probably doesn't even know about this. This is a new phenomenon, and you can see 2015, there's 2007 studies with the word microbiome. So just real quickly, some of these bacteria well, all of them have an impact not only on your genes, but just on your physiology, how your body reacts to stuff. These bacteria talk to our cells. They interact in so many ways we don't understand. Here's four bacteria, FLV and R, I'll, I'll call them. And when you have 
lower levels of these, you increase your risk of asthma. So something about that bacteria is interacting with your immune system to tell it to not attack the lung because asthma is one of those autoimmune diseases. Your own immune system is attacking something in the airway causing inflammation. That's why we give steroids to knock the inflammation down in asthma patients. But let's go deeper. Let's get to the root of why is there inflammation. If we address that, we won't need a steroid to turn the inflammation down. But one of the, the reasons for asthma is because of we're missing these gut bacteria. So these bacteria are found in the gut. They're super important, obviously. Modern food and modern stress kills the bacteria in your gut. We'll get into that more in your nutrition lecture. Um, it's hard for me to limit myself because I really want to teach you all about that. So come back next week <laughs> and we'll talk about that. Here's another one, peanut allergies. This is a research out of Australia. This doctor, 80% of kids with severe peanut allergy, he gave them this bacteria and it resolved the peanut allergy. No more peanut allergy. This one is a study about this bacteria with multiple sclerosis. When you have too many of this bacteria, it's all about balance. Too many of these um, hyper stimulates the immune system and is associated with the autoimmune disease, multiple sclerosis. Another interesting note, they looked in India, they studied the gut flora of people living in India. They don't have very much multiple sclerosis there. And then they looked at these immigrants who came from India to the United States and they watched them over the years and they looked at their gut flora and the bacterial makeup of their gut flora shifted and changed to American gut flora. And their um, incidence of MS went up too. Here's another one, Oxalobacter for meninges and kidney stones. If you're missing that bacteria, you increase your risk of kidney stones. Here's one with skin cancer. Um, I'm not gonna go into details, but basically melanoma went away with this bacteria. When you remove that bacteria, the melanoma came back. And there's a lot more. Here's chronic fatigue study and bacteria in your gut. Here's one with eczema. Here's anxiety and depression. Here's appetite. And I'm, I always have people listen to these um, presentations, try to write down the name of these bacteria. Don't worry about that. This is way too, way more complicated than that. But actually it's simple. You want them all. So what we're gonna teach is how to just um, get your terrain, your gut, into a, a state where these bacteria will populate all by themselves. If you just eat some fermented food and get outside in nature, these bacteria will naturally come back and stop doing the things that kill that bacteria, which again we'll talk about next week. We're gonna skip the nutrition because we're doing that next week. I was just gonna give you all a little taste. Um, well, I'll give you a little taste, but only this one because I've got to move on. <laughs> this is a really smart guy, Linus Pauling. If you hadn't heard of him, he won two Nobel, two Nobel Prizes. And he said, you can trace almost every sickness, every disease, and every ailment to a mineral deficiency. And as we'll see next week, the minerals are completely depleted out of our food. You can be eating God food. You can be eating the rainbow, eating you know, vegetables and produce, all that, but the minerals are depleted because the soil is depleted because of the way we have mismanaged the earth, mismanaged the soil. And we'll get into more of that detail next week. But I'm gonna skip ahead, and I know we started late, so I am gonna run a little past 2.30. And if y'all need to go, that you'll have a recording of this, so no problem. I think we're like 10 minutes late, so we still have a little time. Um, I'm jumping ahead to this slide. <clears throat> Dr. Caroline Leaf, colleague of mine, she's a, uh, and a great lady. I've got to meet her and speak with her many times. Um, her research in this book, Switch on Your Brain, is just fascinating. Um, and we'll talk much more about this during the lecture, um, the class on the peace pillar. But I'll bring it up now as to give you a little taste of the epigenetic phenomenon, the things that turn on these genes and turn them off. It's not just going to be physical stuff like minerals. Yes, minerals are important. We'll, we'll get into that. I supplement with minerals every day because my food doesn't have it. So there are, you need to physical, you need to steward the physical for sure, but you cannot ignore the spiritual. You can't ignore your thoughts. And that's what this book talks about in the research that's pointed out here on this slide. 75 to 98% of mental, physical, and behavioral illness comes from one's thought life, and that was out of published out of Harvard Medical School, the Mind Body Institute. The DNA changes shape according to our thoughts, like I mentioned earlier. Anger, fear, frustration cause the DNA to tighten up and become shorter, which switched off many DNA codes. This was reversed by feelings of love, joy, appreciation, gratitude. 
that's just one little excerpt from her book. So Caroline Leaf does a great job of explaining, taking the science and the published data and um, convincing you that you really need to consider what you're thinking on. And in, in particular with this coronavirus issue right now, and so many people's thoughts going to death and dying and, and the fear and the anxiety, if they only knew and understood the impact of those thoughts, they're cutting the legs out from under their immune system. The backbone of your immune system is being affected by your thoughts. And no one, not the vast majority of Americans don't understand this. So we'll talk about that as an epigenetic factor too. Um, and I'm hoping to convince you, I'm hoping you're seeing now that there really is number one science behind this and that the four pillars have um, legs to stand on from a scientific standpoint, but hopefully just a common sense standpoint. And like my wife would say, she doesn't need any of this science. Um, it just resonates with her as truth, and she's real dialed in spiritually, I would say, to the truth. And so if that's where you're at, great. Um, just sit back and uh, tune us out <laughs> maybe the next three weeks if you don't need all the science behind the physical stuff. Um, but for most Western-minded people, Western thinkers, people who live in the West, and especially doctors and, and people that are sick and people that are going to conventionally trained physicians for relief. Um, this could be an eye-opening and sometimes hard to believe um, phenomenon that all this tidal wave of cancer and heart disease and coronavirus and all this is totally preventable, almost always. Um, yes, there is some sickness that I'm not saying every single person is going to be well. There are some genetic things. There are some genes that are just missing with some, you know, cystic fibrosis and Down syndrome. There is some real alterations that can happen of our genes and our physiology. So, but I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about this overwhelming tidal wave and cascade of chronic disease. So here's what Dr. Mark Hyman says. Dr. Hyman was a doctor kind of like me in a small town in Idaho, busy, 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 and he got sick. He got, uh, don't quote me on this. I believe it was depression and chronic fatigue and different things and he went to his colleagues got some medication it didn't help he got worse and worse he went to the specialist he never got better so he had to basically he was forced to um, f get to the root cause and he did and now he's the head of the Institute of Functional Medicine at Cleveland Clinic and here's what he said the way most doctors practice medicine right now isn't working I think I made a pretty good case for that we're doing lots of stuff and spending lots of money but getting horrible outcomes Medical students are trained to see the body as a collection of isolated parts instead of one whole system. So if you have arthritis, you go to the rheumatologist. If you have a heart problem, you go to the cardiologist. If you have a lung problem, you go to the pulmonologist. If you have a gastrointestinal problem, you go to the gastroenterologist. And that's how we're taught. We're, we separate the body into these different individualized systems, and that's it. That's what he's talking about. The ensuing move toward medical specialization, which is organizing medicine by organs and disease, by location and symptoms, is flawed. And as a result, modern medicine is at a breaking point. Couldn't have said it better myself. And again, why is this? Because doctors think there's only two options. Patients think there are only, there are only two options. We need to highlight option three. And we need to get option three into the curriculum. Unfortunately, option three is not patentable and there's not any research dollars going to non-patentable stuff. Had to throw this in too because it is a point we need to make. If you're just going to treat a symptom with a pharmaceutical, expect unintended consequences, one being medical errors, and actually the third leading cause of death right now is prescription drugs and medical errors. And these are prescription drugs taken the right way, the right dose, not this opioid crisis and overdosing. I'm just talking about normal medications given appropriately can cause death and other problems. And that's why you expect the headlines like I went through at the beginning, these kind of awful stats, spend a lot of money. So I'll have pe people ask me sometimes, <clears throat> so doc, tell me about this alternative medicine you do. <laughs> and I know what they mean, and I used to say the same thing. I mean, I used to think all these alternative things were crazy, quackery, and whatever. 
But I think it's clear we do need an alternative, obviously. We're getting horrible outcomes, and we're spending so much money doing it. So, but be careful. When it comes to alternative, there's a lot of things out there. Um, so we need to understand there's the conventional medicine. That's what everyone understands. And then there's this integrative realm that encompasses lots of different things. And then there's what I would call the Veritas Four Pillar Approach. And that's the point of this class in Veritas Wellness is to drill down past even integrative medicine into a deeper foundation. So hopefully you will rarely need intervention in this realm or this realm. Rarely. Integrative medicine, what's that? For those of you who don't know, that's everything else. So you hear about these acupuncturists and different herbalists and vitamins and chiropractic and saunas and all these things. And this is just a very small list. I mean, there's hundreds of things in the integrative realm. And we employ some of these in our clinic. I mean, ozone and UV light therapies, well documented to work well against viruses, including Ebola and coronavirus. There's documented research, and I've pointed to it um, many times that shows how these things stimulate your natural healing abilities. So basically natural therapies, integrative therapies come alongside your body's um, attempts to correct things and to fight things and, and um, heal things. They work in conjunction with, in synergy with, where pharmaceuticals are coming in in a totally different manner and just trying to hijack and manipulate and force things from a chemical perspective. And so, you know, these are great. They're more natural. They line up more synergistically with the body's natural healing abilities. And, you know, I'd, I'd recommend them for certain patients. The point I try to tell my patients is ozone's not the cure. None of these things are the cure. So if you need to put a Band-Aid on for a minute or a tourniquet on for a minute to stop the bleeding, that's fine. But you can't keep that tourniquet on forever. You've got to eventually address the problem. And that's what we're trying to convince you to do. Um, with the four pillars. So go deeper. It's not that you can't ever use symptomatic medicine. A couple examples, berberine is an herb for metformin, or excuse me, an herb for diabetes, and metformin's the drug for diabetes. They did a study head-to-head, -head, and what they found is they're very similar, the herb and the drug. I never heard of berberine. I didn't get trained in that medical school. A lot of natural doctors, I'd say all natural doctors, know about berberine, and they would prescribe that right away for a type 2 diabetic. But as I told you before, just treat the temperature, not the source of the, the fever, and you're going to have unintended consequences. So don't just use berberine for your diabetes because you want to be green and want to be natural. It's fine for the moment, but fix the problem, which is insulin resistance. Here's another one with chronic prostatitis, and this is an herb, and they use this herb, and they cured 89% of these patients. Complete resolution of symptoms with this herb, which is awesome because otherwise in conventional medicine you're going to use antibiotics. And antibiotics can get similar results, but the antibiotics are going to kill your good bacteria in your gut. This herb won't. So there are benefits to knowing about some of these things, but my, my statement would be, why do you have chronic prostatitis? You shouldn't have an inflamed prostate. There's a root cause to that. Try to address that. Here's another one, depression, Zoloft versus rhodiola, an herb. Equal efficacy. However, the rhodiola had 30% side effect versus Zoloft had 63% side effects. Just another example. Uh, acupuncture was brought in. The Western world kind of first uh, gave it any credence when uh, I think it was Nixon went to China in the 19, yeah, President Nixon, 1971, went to China. And this Reston, he was a uh, journalist, had an acute attack of appendicitis, hospitalized in China. The appendix was removed. They used acupuncture for his pain management during the hospitalization. So that opened the Western world's eyes to acupuncture. So these things work, they're beneficial, low side effects are fine. It's just not the answer. So what is the answer? This is Dr. William Osler. He's a founder of John Hopkins Medical School. And this is what he said, one of the first duties of the physician is to educate the masses not to take medicine. That's what we're doing with this class. We're trying to educate you so you won't need to take medicine. We don't just stop people's medicines, obviously but you try to get their health stewarded to the point they don't need medicine anymore. Here's another pretty smart guy. Edison said the doctor of the future will give no medicine, but will instruct his patients in the care of the human frame, in diet, and in the cause and prevention of disease. So that is the point of the Veritas method, which is nutrition, hydration, movement, and peace. We will be teaching on those four topics over the next four weeks, and we'll do a wrap up at the end. And then hopefully Dr. Hyman's statement here, 20 years from now, every doctor will practice this way. I hope. 
I kind of have my doubts, again, because um, money is involved in these processes. Research is biased, and I do just for a brief second in our last couple minutes we have here. We have to be real careful with research, guys. Research is done by human beings, and human beings are corruptible. We're biased. We come in with certain, even when we try to be unbiased, and we try to limit those bias, biases, and we try to correct form, and we try to do these things, but they're still there. There's not a whole lot of government money for re medical research. There's some with the NIH, but not much. Um, the private money, almost all of it is pharmaceutical company. That's just the way it is. That's just a factual statement. <laughs> and it turns out when you have a system like that, and this is Do uh, Ben Goldberg has a great TED talk on this. One of the issues with that is this pervasive, all fields of medicine, half of all trials being buried. Positive findings twice as likely to be published. What that means is, I'm going to take Tamiflu for an example. So if the drug company that makes Tamiflu starts to fund a lot of studies for it and those study data the data starts to come out of those studies and it's not positive, Tamiflu doesn't help at all, they just don't publish it. They just put that data in a shelf somewhere and they never publish it. It's called publication bias. And that's what Goldberg is say, stating. Positive findings are twice as likely to be published. So just because you do a study doesn't mean you have to publish it, although they did pass a regulation saying that you do have to, that's, it's not done. Many, many, many studies are not published and it turns out if they don't, have the beneficial effect that they want, they just they don't publish it. And then they can tweak and massage that data and try to manipulate that study to get the positive outcome. It's just the way it is. That is what in part led to the New England Journal of Medicine editor-in-chief, Marcia Angel, to say this, it is simply no longer possible to believe much of the clinical research that is published or to rely on the judgment of trusted physicians or authoritative medical guidelines. I take no pleasure in this conclusion, which I reach slowly and reluctantly over my two decades as editor-in-chief of the New England Journal of Medicine. Her colleague, Dr. Richard Horton, and he's at the Lancet editor-in-chief. Lancet's a, probably the world's number one medical journal. Much of the scientific literature, perhaps half, may simply be untrue. Afflicted by studies with small sample size, tiny effects, invalid exploratory analysis, and flagrant conflicts of interest, together with, no, with an obsession for pursuing fashionable trends of dubious importance, science has taken a turn towards darkness. I'm not saying science is bad or you can't consider some studies. What I'm saying is you have to be very careful. Studies come out very well could be biased, very well um, could be influenced by people that have something to gain. And the media, of course, wants to s sensationalize everything. And unfortunately, the media also is funded by many of the pharmaceuticals as far as their advertisement dollars. And I don't like to get a whole off into these tangents of conspiracy theory and all that, but uh, it is something we need to be aware of and you need to have discernment about and you need to not just bow down to this God, I'll say, of science um, and your doctor. <laughs> Some people put their doctor up on the pedestal like a God, and we need to be very, very careful. Um, not just careful, don't do that. <laughs> We're just humans. E even more natural leaning like me, your body has the cure. Give it what it needs, avoid what it doesn't, it will fix itself. A doctor can teach, but others can too. You have to receive that teaching, then you have to go do it. You have to actually implement it, and that's where our navigators come in. So what we've seen over seven or eight years, and these testimonials are on our website, veritasmedical.com, people get better. And I'm not going to go through every one of these, and this isn't to brag. My point is the rheumatoid arthritis and the ADHD and asthma that Brinson had and Dr. Jeff Welchel's bad ulcerative colitis, and then Jenny's daughter that had horrible allergies, so much so they told her she was allergic to outside, allergic to dirt, couldn't go outside, basically bubble boy, <laughs> bubble girl. And all these people got better and are symptom free. And it's not because of some magic potion we gave them. It's because they implemented these aggressive diet and lifestyle things to reverse their diseases of inflammation. This inflammation's coming from somewhere, guys, and it's rooted in the diet and lifestyle. put that picture on last because to just as a reminder 
you can treat symptoms. Conventional medicine can treat symptoms. And that system produces certain outcomes. And if you work that system really good, like I did in post, um, everyone can think you're doing really good and your numbers look really good and you get put on the front page of the paper. But the outcomes, you can't get them. You can't get them in that system. Um, we've got to get outside that system, I've decided. I don't think we can change that system. I use that system for emergencies like trauma if I'm in a car wreck or break an arm or something, but that's about it. Otherwise, I stay out of that system. And it's time for us to build a new system, a system rooted in the truth. So I think um, y'all are wise for looking outside the conventional systems and looking for something else. Um, I'm not saying we know it all or have every answer. Well, I know we don't, um, but we have a piece of it, and we hope to bridge that gap and help you bridge that gap and be a stepping stone for you on your journey to true wellness, because I honestly believe you can be healthy and not need a doctor, live all the days of your life. Your health span should match your lifespan. Your spirit's called home, back to God. Your flesh falls over dead. That's it. That's how it should be. You should be physically and mentally fit. It makes no sense that God would number our days but then give us a physical body that starts to decline at age 27 when we're going to live to age 85 or whatever our number of days are. It doesn't make sense at all. So thank you for joining us today. Um, look forward to spending the next six weeks with you. I know this is a little different for me being virtual, but um, we'll be happy to take any questions now. Um, I'm not limited on my time. Well, I am, but I could stay a few minutes is what I'm saying. I don't have to rush out right now, so if I need to take a couple of questions, but I want to encourage you. The questions really um, and the support and the one-on-one, -on -one, that's where the wellness navigators come in. Um, Angie and Nicole, in fact, here's their picture. So this is Kim here. She's our newest wellness navigator, Kim Walker. Here's Nicole Powell, and here's Angie Romans. Angie's been with me the longest, probably six years, and then Nicole's just been with me a couple years. We were, her and her husband were best friends with my wife and I when we were back in post. She thought we were crazy when we went the more natural realm, and now she's, um, she's the biggest fan, and she's one of our navigators. So these ladies will be in touch with you. You'll be receiving an email um, later today or in the morning. Um, with more details of next steps. So there's a private forum that you can interact with them on and we'll put out, they will put out um, tidbits of information and helpful tips and recipes and things like that. If you haven't downloaded um, the ebook that has some of that good, those resources in there, they'll help you to do that. Um, they're available for one-on-ones. Um, group Q&A we'll have um, on a regular basis and of course me every week coming in and teaching the why. So they'll be in touch with you soon. Be looking for that and feel free to use the heck out of them. That really is the value of the program is your ability to interact with these navigators. So um, again, um, really appreciate you being with us. Look forward to hopefully meeting y'all face to face someday. And if you're ever in Lubbock, Texas, you're welcome to stop by the clinic and say hi. And, um, we'd love to meet you, and we'll see you next week. Tim, were there any pressing questions? Okay, so next week, same time, same place, we'll talk about nutrition. We'll take a good medium dive into nutrition so you'll know what to eat and why to eat it. And you'll know you're not what you eat. You are what you can digest and absorb. So we'll talk about things that impact, impact your digestion. Okay, see you all next week. Bye-bye.